Hi, and welcome to the Haddonfield United Methodist Church Weekly Sermon Podcast. For more information about us or anything you hear in this episode, be sure to visit HaddonfieldUMC.org. We hope that this and every episode can help sustain you on the journey as together we seek to put our faith into action. Hi friends, welcome to our sermon podcast. I'm Reverend Chris Heckert, Senior Pastor here at Haddonfield UMC. Uh, Today I'm gonna be looking at John 14. We're beginning a new sermon series, The Way, The Truth, and The Life. What do you do when you find yourself lost, not knowing how to find the right path? Fortunately, today we have smartphones and virtual maps to help us navigate the way. But what about with our lives? How do we make good decisions to find the right path that leads to meaning, purpose, and fulfillment? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, giving us a guide to navigate life's difficult paths in which we are never alone and always have love as the primary destination. Join us this September as we kick off a new year of discipleship together with the way, the truth, and the life. Our sermon text today is John chapter 14, verses 1 through 10. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also." And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does this work. Well, have you ever found yourself lost somewhere and trying to find directions to get back to where you want to be? This past summer, my family and I had a great time uh, in England, and uh, we were in London for a few days, and my kids got to experience paper maps as we were trying to navigate the public transportation system in the city of London, including buses and trains and the like. And I remember being absolutely flustered and not able to figure out or navigate or understand why this bus wasn't here. And we waited and waited and we're looking at maps. And it led to an amazing conversation with my kids about the evolution of maps. They, of course, wanted us just to use our phone and to go online and figure out where the bus was and why it wasn't where we were. But all we had was a paper map and the phone was fairly useless to us. So that evening over dinner, we said, imagine a world in which all you have are paper maps. And we went back to when my wife and I were growing up and learning to drive, the best that we had was an atlas or a paper map that you would keep in the glove box. And so you needed to know where you were, where you were going, and you had to map out your way in that map. And then we explained to the kids something that amazing that happened in the 1990s and early 2000s was the evolution of something called MapQuest. And so if you knew where you were going, ahead of time you could type in the address and then you could print out directions and you would have paper that would tell you turn by turn how to get there. So it wasn't you just trying to figure out how to follow a map, but it would say go five miles and then merge onto this highway and then make a left on this street. MapQuest was a game changer and it was amazing, but the short uh, coming that MapQuest had was that if something happened that you got off of the path or off of the directions, 
it was almost impossible to get back on. And when MapQuest really was a thing, I was living in North Jersey outside of New York City, traveling in the city quite a bit. And more often than not, the streets that the map would put me to were closed or were the wrong one way. And so many, many times I found myself lost in the city of Newark or in the city of New York City, not knowing how to get back on the path of MapQuest because I knew where I wanted to go, but I did not know where I was. So then when the GPS came out shortly after, there were these expensive devices called a Garmin or a TomTom. And if you bought this GPS device, it had a little map. And thanks to a global positioning system that communicated with satellites in the sky, it could not only tell you where you needed to go, but the most important thing, it knew where you were, even when you didn't. And there was this magical word that happened with those early GPSs that changed everything. Recalculating. So when you get off the beaten path or you make the wrong turn or you fail to merge, it will recalculate because it knows where you are and where you are going and will help you to determine a new path. The problem with GPSs was that the data wasn't always good and they didn't always have all the right streets. And again, they didn't work particularly well in cities. So I still got lost in New York and Newark and Philadelphia because the GPS had a hard time discerning which of 20 roads that all coincided that I was on. Then the real game changer was when the smartphone and Google, Google Maps and Apple Maps came out. And today, you really don't have to know directions at all. You just, even going to the grocery store, you can put in the destination and it will tell you how to avoid traffic the quickest way, the cheapest way, the most convenient way. We have an amazing gift of technology. And this conversation was fun with my kids because I didn't want them to take what we have today for granted because we don't always have it. And where we really don't have technology for that is in our lives. The problem is, is that it would be amazing to have the same thing for our personal lives as we have for our directional lives. The problem is that when we face challenges and uncertainty in life, we don't often know the destination. And most importantly, sometimes we can lose a sense of where we are. Think about a time where you thought you knew who you were, what your life looked like, who was in your life, and all of a sudden something changed. Relationship fell apart, you lost a job, someone uh, you love passed away, or an opportunity opened up, or whatever it was. Sometimes we can lose a sense of where we are and not know if we're in the right place or not know how we got there. And when we're in that situation, it's difficult to choose the right road to travel because we don't necessarily know where we are or perhaps even where we are going. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And in this passage, John chapter 14, he offers this somewhat confusing for them instruction to see him as their spiritual positioning system to help them to navigate the difficult road ahead. But they ask a very important question to him. Jesus, how can we know the way? Well, John chapters 13 through 17 are known as Jesus's farewell discourse. In the Gospel of John, uh, they are at the Last Supper, that Passover table in uh, outside of Jerusalem. And in this farewell discourse, these four chapters, Jesus is trying to prepare his disciples for a tough road ahead. He knows he will be arrested. He knows he will be crucified. He knows what is ahead, but his disciples, no matter how many times he tries to warn them and give them insight, they just don't get it. And so this farewell discourse is a time of teaching, and Jesus changes his focus to try and prepare the disciples to be able to navigate what they're going to experience, what they're going to live through, and what they're going to witness. It's going to be very scary. It's going to be very unsettling. But Jesus says, God will be with you, and you have seen God because you have seen me. 
And he says, in God's house, there are many dwelling places, and I am going to prepare a place for, for you. And the disciples say, well, how? How will we know the way? And so Jesus then responds to them by saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. For the next uh, three weeks after today, uh, we are going to be exploring these three sayings of Jesus. Jesus is the way, Jesus is the truth, and Jesus is the life. The way, of course, refers to the example of Jesus. Jesus gives us an example. He gives us teachings through the Gospels. Jesus gives us a way of life. The early church was called the way, the, the early Christian movement, because Jesus as the way gives us literally a way to live our lives. So if we know where we are, or where we're going or not, Jesus at least gives us a path to navigate and discern the next steps and the direction. Jesus is the truth refers to the fact that he gives us a glimpse to God's heart. Jesus says, you know the Father because you know me. And if you know me, you know the Father. Jesus shows us God's heart. We know what is important to God by knowing what is important to Jesus. And then that last week, we're going to look at Jesus as the life, not just something we say or believe in or think, but it is an ongoing relationship with our spiritual positioning system. Jesus, who does not leave us abandoned or orphaned, but is living, breathing, moving in us every day. When Jesus says there are many dwelling places, he is referring to the indwelling of Jesus and all those who believe and follow him, that Jesus travels with us. And that's what it means, the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But in these four chapters, chapter John 13 to 17, the farewell discourse, Jesus changes the focus, not about belief, but about love. He talks about the importance and the vitality of love. He says, people will know you are my disciples by how I love you. The greatest of the commandments is love God, love your neighbor. God loves me and I love you and you love me and therefore you love God. Jesus changes the whole focus and, and therefore the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus points us and shifts us. If we want to know the focus of our faith life when we get lost, what is that ultimate destination? In these chapters, Jesus shows us that the way, the goal of our relationships is love. But just like he says in the Gospel of Matthew, do not love as the world loves. Do not love conditionally, but love not to get in return, but love perfectly as God loves. In so doing, what I believe Jesus is saying, the goal of our lives is love. That final destination, so when we get lost, when, when we get displaced, when we're in grief, when we're in conflict, when we're in depression, whatever is facing, our destination is to find the path, the loving path. And that opens up space for healing. It opens up space for reconciliation. It opens up all kinds of space. But Jesus teaches us, and I would absolutely vouch for it, love is not the way of the world, the commercial world, the things that call us to buy more, to get more, to achieve, to succeed, that happiness and having and achieving and attaining is the highest purpose of our life. That leads us to a place that draws us towards selfishness, violence, protectionism. That is a world that makes war a prevalent thing that we're seeing. That is a thing that's seeing revenge as an appropriate response. That is a thing that makes shootings in schools and other public spaces an ongoing occurrence. Violence is the way of the world. Selfishness, self-seeking is the way of the world. Jesus shows us a different way, a higher way, and friends, a difficult way. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, in uh, his book, Trumpet of Conscience in 1968, which is the same year in which he himself would be assassinated. 
He wrote this, the ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie, nor can you establish truth. The way of the world leads us to violence, which in increases the pattern, or it leads us to selfishness, which increases the pattern. Jesus calls us to a higher way of love. And love, in the eyes of the world, is seen as weak. It's seen as the chump's way, that it doesn't necessarily get us anywhere or anything. But love is not weak. Love is transformative. And it is the only thing that transforms pain and hatred and violence and anger. Jesus shows us in John that love is the way not of emptying. The Gospel of, of Luke shows Jesus' love emptying, emptying himself. In John, love is a love of fullness, of having full relationships, of having the fullness of God's presence. We're not called to a love that, that leaves us with nothing. We are called to a love that really gives us what the world does not give us, something purpose fulfillment, and the wealth of God's love that achieving, having, being, and doing cannot give us. Now, we have in us an imprinted need for a relationship. The world is increasingly transactional. We, we get, we buy, we purchase, we receive, but we need relationships to thrive in our lives. Love is only obtainable through relationship, and that relationship Jesus shows us is with God. It's not believe something and we get from God, but it's journey with God. Practice things that put us in relationship and in the place of God. Living a life of, of uh, following Jesus means to make loving others and love God our goal, even when we get lost, even when we mess up, even when things break down and we say, how did I get here? Jesus calls us to get up and to make love the destination. And Jesus will show us the way by giving us the truth and never leaving us through the life. But how, you may be asking yourself, yeah, that sounds nice. But how can we make love the goal of our lives? The average person makes between 30 and 35,000 different decisions on a daily basis. Most of the decisions that we make uh, are not made consciously, but they are made through habits, patterns, and categorical decisions. Following Jesus in the same way means to make the rhythm of our life in practicing things that put us into close contact with God's grace. Put habits and practices and rhythms into our lives so that we are in proximity to God's grace that can redeem, strengthen, heal, and forgive us. Making love the goal of our faith is not about having the right head knowledge, but it's about developing a muscle memory that comes from trying, failing, and allowing God to heal us, help us, and to help us get back up. I cannot tell you how many times I have failed at love, loving family members and strangers. And, and I have failed and tried and failed and tried. And the beauty has always come in how God redeems our broken and feeble attempts. And the muscle memory that comes from remembering that although I want to get back at someone, I want to say this thing, I want them to know how much they hurt me. When love becomes the goal as Jesus has loved us, God can do things that we can never imagine that God can do. God can make healing possible, reconciliation possible, and restoration possible in ways in which we never uh, would imagine. But how do we keep love as our muscle memory and our rhythm? John Wesley called these the means of grace, regular rhythms that we put into our lives, whether it's through daily prayers or spiritual practices or scripture or fasting or meditating or worship, but we need practices, and most of all, we need relationships as a part of our lives that help us to remember when we are lost, when we don't know the way forward, to remember not only is love the destination, but love is the way 
and the path to begin with. For the last year and a half, I have had the great fortune to be uh, enrolled in a doctoral program, doctor in ministry, through Wesley Seminary in Washington, D.C., and my classes have been at uh, Cambridge University in uh, the United Kingdom. And uh, this fall, I'm looking at doing my doctoral project, which is the equivalent of a, of a dissertation in this program. And my pilot project is going to focus on making love the goal, particularly for a group of 20-somethings. My premise is that the way that churches used to form faith, Sunday school and other things, is not really working like it used to because of a whole myriad of reasons. And so I'm returning to one of the old practices of the early Methodist movement, which is micro-community, putting people into community and close relationship with one another to try and live out our faith. And so for my project, I'm going to be developing resources that inspire a group of six to eight, twenty-somethings, and put them into relationship with one another, asking each other these questions week in and week out for about six weeks. How is your faith journey going? And how is love perfecting your life? I have piloted my, my own small group in, uh, in this way in the last year, and we've met a, a group of about seven of us every single week for a year. And when we show up week after week, how's your practice of faith going? How is God's love working in your life? And what are some challenges that you need to pray for this week? I cannot tell you how that has changed my experience and the experience of the other people in my group in being open and all of a sudden seeing, oh my gosh, God is showing up in all these ways. So in the project that I'm going to be launching with some 20-somethings this fall, I'm going to be asking them, make love the goal of your life and then share that experience with other people. And so week after week, they're going to talk about what does it mean to love that really difficult coworker. What does it mean to accept God's love in their own lives if they feel like they're not achieving enough or that they're, they're, they're not worthy? Sharing the journey is a part of being in the body of Christ. Jesus called his disciples not one by one, but as a community, as, as a group, because Jesus is experienced and lived out as we make love the goal, but as we share it in Christian community. Today, it is so easy for us to see faith and how faith and religion can divide people by highlighting our differences, our different beliefs, our different backgrounds, our different political uh, allegiances. But faith in Jesus is not about head knowledge. And, and it's not about right thinking or even having the correct beliefs. Faith in Jesus is about practicing the commandments to love God to love our neighbor, and to love one another as Jesus commanded us, and to walk with Jesus to perfect us, to shape us, to heal us, and to help us to get back down. Here's the beautiful thing about the gospel. We will fall down. We will get lost. Our plans will fail from time to time. But Jesus will always help us to know where we are and where we need to go and to find that path and that path is to ask the question, what does love look like here? What does the love of Jesus Christ look like? I believe that John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, said it the best. Remembering that God is love, genuine Christians are conformed to the same likeness. They are full of love for their neighbors, of universal love not confined to one sect or party, not restrained to those who agree with them in opinions or in outward modes of worship, or to those who are allied to them by blood or are recommended by nearness of place. Neither do they love those only that love them or that are endeared to them by intimacy of acquaintance. But their love resembles that of God whose mercy is over all God's works. It soars above all these scanty bounds, embracing neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies. Yes, not only the good and gentle, but also the disobedient, the evil and the unthankful, for they love every soul that God has made 
every child of humanity. Let us together make love the goal of our lives, and we rely on Jesus as our spiritual positioning system, as our guide, and as the bond that holds us together. Well, friend, I'm so grateful that you joined me for this podcast. Pray that you share it. I pray that we can live this out and make love our goal with Jesus as our guide. We will be the church in a hurting world. Thanks again for listening. For more information about us or anything you heard in this episode, be sure to visit HaddonfieldUMC.org. Through today's scripture and message, we pray that you find strength to go deeper into love of God and neighbor as we work together to be the church in a hurting world.